All right, good afternoon, Lift Community Church, and thank you for joining us for our noon live Bible study. And we are continuing our study in the book of James. So uh, let's jump in and do this. Um, let's open with a quick word of prayer, and then we'll get started. Gracious God, we thank you for the opportunity to gather virtually and we uh, ask for your spirit to give us wisdom as we study the book of James. And we thank you and pray this in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Just a simple, quick prayer there. And uh, last week we talked about a little bit about who James was. He was believed to have been the brother of Jesus. And he was um, killed uh, by stoning uh, for violating the law under the high priest Annas II in 62 um, AD. And uh, he, his, his letter, uh, Martin Luther, of course, called it a pistol of straw because he didn't think it was worthwhile, but uh, it has a lot of good stuff in it. And uh, he, there's kind of four sections that we're going to cover and today we're going to do the rich, the poor, and the law, and faith as faith and versus works, or faith and works. And then next week we'll look at the division of the Christian community and how the Christian community um, is to behave with one another. <clears throat> and we'll kind of touch on that too, because that kind of actually goes throughout the whole thing. So let's look at uh, the rich, the poor, and the law. So in chapter 2, verses 2 through 4, and I'm using the New Living Translation, it says, my dear brothers and sisters, how can you claim to have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ if you favor some people over others? For example, suppose someone comes into your meeting dressed in fancy clothes and expensive jewelry, and another comes in who is poor and dressed in dirty clothes. If you give special attention and a good seat to the rich person, but you say to the poor one, you stand over there or sit on the floor, well, doesn't this discrimin discrimination show that your judgments are guided by uh, evil motives? All right, so um, the interesting thing about the word meeting here, it actually is synagogue. Um, this would have been prior to the split between the Christian church and, um, and, and uh, the synagogues. Uh, you know, up to, up to this point, Christians are still considered a sect of Judaism, and they are worshiping in synagogues. Uh, and so this would have been true for James. Now we know that he was considered the leader of the Jerusalem church, but the official split between Judaism and Christianity didn't happen until probably roughly 90 AD, or common era CE. And so uh, that's 30 years after James died, uh, which means that um, uh, that even though James is, is sort of like the de facto leader of the Jerusalem church, it's, it is still, they still were worshiping in synagogues. They're, they don't really have a, um, a, a, they're not separate from synagogues yet. Um, all right, so that's um, just an important thing to know about the, the, con the context of this particular letter and um, James and his community of faith. Um, all right, so let's jump into the exploitation of the poor. So in verses 5 through 7, he goes on to say, Listen to me, dear brothers and sisters. Hasn't God chosen the poor in this world to, to inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him? But you dishonor the poor. Isn't, the rich who, isn't it the rich who oppress you and drag you into court? Aren't they the ones who slander Jesus Christ, whose noble name you bear? Um, so, uh, he's coming down pretty hard on those who are wealthy. Um, it's a kind of a, a, a um, kind of a, 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 kind of a, not a throwback, but a, a, um, I guess throw forward. This was probably written, well, let's see, when was 1 Corinthians written? I'm not even sure. Um, but it, it, it does reflect some of the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians, which I want us to look at real quickly. Uh, so if, if you're following along, look at 1 Corinthians 6, verses 1 through 8. And in 1 Corinthians 6, Paul has something to say about dragging one another into court. Um, 
when you, chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians, when one of you has a dispute with another believer, how dare you file a lawsuit and ask a secular court to decide the matter instead of taking it to other believers? Don't you realize that someday we believers will judge the world? And since you are going to judge the world, can't you decide even these little things among yourselves? Don't you realize that we will judge angels? So you should surely be able to resolve ordinary disputes in this life. If you have legal disputes about such matters, why go to outside judges who are not respected by the church? I'm saying this to shame you. Isn't there anyone in all the church who is wise enough to decide these issues? But instead, one believer sues another right in front of unbelievers. So Paul's pretty critical of of Christians suing one another um, in secular courts. You know, I, I really wonder how that would work out in in the world today. <laughs> I, I mention this all the time when we're talking about these ancient letters that, that were written. Um, uh, what, what do they mean to us today? And that's one right there. That's a big one. What what would that look like today if we were to, to live that out? Um, so that's just something to be thinking about. Um, but uh, apparently, you know, in, in, in Corinth, Christians were using secular courts to sue other, other Christians, other believers. And Paul's, Paul says that, sh- that shouldn't happen. Um, James, of course, um, he's referring to um, uh, rich, the rich people taking the poor to court. Um, this probably, though, for James, wouldn't have been a secular court. More than likely, it would have been the Sanhedrin. There were uh, two. There was the lesser Sanhedrin. In ancient Judaism, um, there were every ancient city, every city in ancient Israel was to have um, a lesser Sanhedrin or a lesser court and a greater Sanhedrin, a greater court. And the lesser was 23 judges, and the greater court was 71 judges. Interesting enough that they're odd numbers, right? So if there's there can't be a tie, um, and uh, the if you appealed, if you didn't like the ruling of the lesser court, the lesser Sanhedrin, you would take it to the greater Sanhedrin. Um, so this is probably what James is referring to: is 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 um, people being taken to um, the Sanhedrin. Now. Um, Paul specifically is talking about um, secular courts. So um, uh, I would say that, that the, the Christians are, are not um, taking people to the Sanhedrin. He's talking about people going outside of um, the Jewish courts. This is why I think I should have gone back and looked and see, to see when um, 1 Corinthians was written because um, it brings up the question... Um, when did um, uh, the, Paul write this letter? Because obviously he's talking about secular courts and James is talking about the Jewish courts. Um, so I, I'm going to go back and look at that because I want to figure out um, kind of time-wise when, when that all fell into place. Um, but um, in terms of um, how we are to treat one another, which is this is still applicable to us today. You know, Paul's saying you shouldn't be dragging each other into court and suing each other. Um, and James also is saying this here. He's like, you you need to, he goes on to say in verse eight, yes, indeed, it, it is good when you obey the royal law found in the scriptures, love your neighbor as yourself. Remember Jesus said the greatest commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, body, soul, and strength. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Um, so love is to be the guiding principle for Christians. And, and Paul very much um, believe that, you know, in his litany of love in 1 Corinthians 13, he says, love keeps no record of wrongs. Love is to be the guiding principle. James is also saying the same thing. Um, this is int- interesting because, you know, Martin Luther had such an issue with, with uh, the book of James. Um, but uh, one of, I think probably the big issue for James was that he said that uh, you are saved by faith alone. Um, and of course, in verse 17 of chapter 2 of James, he says, uh, So you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. Um, I think that's probably the exception that Martin Luther had. Um, but they all pretty much were saying the same thing. Paul and James... Um, 
and Martin Luther, and they're all reflecting the words of Jesus um, when he said um, that the purpose of the, you gotta look at the purpose or the intent of the law. Um, and what I want us to look at in terms of what Jesus was, te in his teaching about the law, is in Matthew, so if you wanna switch over here to Matthew chapter five, the Sermon on the Mount, we're just gonna look at one quick section, but verse 21, and he says, and 22, you have heard that our ancestors were told you must not murder. If you commit murder, you are subject to judgment. But I say, if you are even angry with someone, you are subject to judgment. If you call someone an idiot, um, you are in danger. I, I'm in danger. I call people idiots all the time. So this, but if you call someone an idiot, you're in danger of being brought before the court. And again, this court would have been the Sanhedrin, Sanhedrin court. Um, but what Jesus is getting at is what's in your heart. That's the intent of the law. The, it's not about, you know, well, I follow the law to the letter. It's about what's in your heart, right? That's the purpose and the intent of the law. So James and Paul and Martin Luther all are trying to be faithful to what Jesus taught. They're all pretty much saying the same thing. Put your money where your mouth is. That's pretty much it. Put your money where your mouth is. Does your faith, is your faith lived out in love? Do your actions reflect the love of God dwelling within you? Um, and the image in which you were created, right? We were created in the image of God, and God is love, as First John says. So you were created in the image of love. Are you living that out? That's essentially what James is saying. That's what Paul is saying. It's what Martin Luther was saying. They're all pretty much agreeing and saying the same thing. Um, all right. Um... I, 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 we talked a little bit about this last week, but James being a faithful Jewish person um, and, and brother of Jesus, uh, he w would have been a faithful Jewish person and um, understanding the law, but he, he didn't like, he wasn't a hardline person when it came to the law. Uh, and so there are two verses in particular, James 1, chapter 1, verse 25, that says, uh, but if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do whatever, do what it says and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. And then he repeats it in chapter 2, verse 12. So whatever you say or whatever you do, remember that you will be judged by the law that sets you free. So twice he mentions that the law sets you free. The purpose of the law was not to be burdensome. Um, and so this is, this is, I think, an important point in terms of Christians, many Christians today. Um, there's this idea that, well, uh, Jesus fulfilled the law, so, you know, it doesn't apply to us anymore. You know, James is a Christian here. Yes, he's a faithful Jewish person, um, but he would also consider himself a Christian. He was head of the Christian church in Jerusalem. Um, so he, he is not saying that the law doesn't apply to us anymore. James is saying, yes, the law applies to you, and you have to live it out. Um, and he live out the intent of the law, which is love. That's love. That's the intent of the law. Um, so this idea that Christians are sort of exempt from the Jewish law, that, that doesn't, that's not at all what James is saying. That's not what early Christians said. Um, and that's not, I don't think, a faithful interpretation of what Jesus was trying to teach us. Um, Jesus was teaching us the intent of the law, which is that we love one another, but that we look at the content of our hearts. Um, all right, so, um, yeah, I think that's pretty clear on that. Um, all right, let's jump into faith and works. Um, we touched a little bit, a, a little bit on that, uh, but in verses fourteen through seventeen, he addresses a, l a little more uh, faithfully here. He says, "What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing, and you say goodbye and have a good day, stay warm and eat well, but that you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do?" Right? I mean, it's it's really about being practical. Um, if you truly love others, and if you the second part of the law, which is that you love your neighbor as yourself, um, you feed and clothe yourself, and if you have the means to do that, then you should also ensure that others have the means to do that. Uh, so, um, yeah, I mean, love sort of being this encompassing way to um, interpret the law is what this is all about. 
That's what faith and works is. Faith should be the evidence of the love of God dwelling within you. And that means caring for others um, and being concerned about them. And so I, I, I just I mentioned this. If you watch the sermon on Sunday, uh, you know, I told the story of the, that Jesus told of the rich man and Lazarus. And, um, you know, a lot of times people want to ta- use that story as, as, as an illustration about heaven and hell. Jesus didn't mean it as an illustration of heaven and hell. It was about a, an illustration of how to be a decent human being, how to love other people, how to have compassion for people. So if you, if you know the story, remember the story or saw the sermon on Sunday, the rich man, you know, he literally has to step over Lazarus who is laying there covered in sores um, right by his house. He has to step over him to get into his house. And that when they both die, you know, the, the rich man is, is in torment and, the, and Lazarus is in the bosom of Abraham. And the, even then the rich man says, will you send La- to Abraham, send Lazarus to dip his finger in water to cool my tongue? He's still, even in this place of torment, looking down on Lazarus as less than. He doesn't see the value of Lazarus as a human being. He doesn't love Lazarus. Um, he's still wanting Lazarus to come and serve him. Um, and really the point of Jesus' story is, of the rich man Lazarus is, be a decent human being, have compassion on people. Um, and, and the other point is because once you're dead, it's too late. Once you're dead, it's too late. Um, bottom line, you can't be kind to people. You can't love others once you're dead. It's too late. So that's the purpose and point uh, of the rich man and Lazarus story. And I think that that's the purpose and point of what James is trying to get across in his letter here in terms of faith and works and how we live out our faith. Um, It is about loving others, having compassion on people, um, not dragging them into court, um, not taking advantage of them um, as the rich were doing to the poor here in in James's community. yeah, that's all I've got today, and so uh, hopefully that was helpful and instructive and um, applic- uh, uh, applicable to you. Uh, to next week, we will talk about the the division of in in the uh, divisions within the Christian community, and then how the Christian community is to behave. It'll be it'll be continuation kind of of this. Obviously, the Christian community is to behave in love and compassion for one another and for others. So, all right. Well, let's, uh, let's close in prayer. Gracious God, we thank you.